Okay, so uh, uh, welcome, Catherine, to uh, to our conference, uh, Tokenomics, and Catherine will be our next keynote speaker. Um, and uh, initially, I thought that Catherine is one of those uh, people who um, does not need introduction. Right, my next guest needs no introduction. And then I overheard uh, a conversation of exchange uh, between two computer scientists, and one is saying. Oh, this uh, Katrin Tacker, she's a she's marketing professor. Is, is this a good fit for tokenomics? <laughs> and the other one says, are you kidding me? We are trying to get her to speak, you know, to us for, for a while. You know, do you remember this study when they gave Bitcoin to, uh, to MIT students and like, and this was published in science. It's like, oh, a marketing professor. <laughs> and so I, I thought that it's, you know, this is a perfect example of uh, how uh, blockchain topics are cutting across different disciplines. And it's not just economics and computer science, but but many, many more. And therefore, I, you know, I think that maybe maybe there is a need for some introduction uh, to who Katrin uh, Tucker is and why uh, she is here. And and I'm very excited to have her at, at Tokenomics. So, uh, so Katrin Tucker is... Uh, a uh, Sloan Distinguished Professor uh, and, and a pro uh, Sloan Distinguished Professor of Management and a Professor of Marketing at MIT, uh, MIT Sloan, School, uh, Sloan uh, Business School. Um, her PhD is in economics and her research is at the intersection of economics, marketing, technology, and law. And particular expertise is on online advertising, on digital health, on social media, on digital, um, digital privacy, and also on blockchain and cryptocurrencies. Uh, she uh, she co-authored one of the first study, if it was not the first study, on blockchain adoption. That's the, exactly the study uh, where, uh, uh, where the uh, uh, Bitcoin was given away to MIT students uh, in the dorms and, um, and the activity was being followed. That was in 2014 when Bitcoin was worth $200. So that kind of we can date time now by the price of Bitcoin. Um, and it was published in Science. Around that time, she co-founded uh, MIT Crypto Economics Labs, which uh, a crypto economics lab, which studies applications of blockchain. Um, so very much uh, active there are many other papers uh, since that, uh, that study on blockchain adoption. Um, Catherine uh, received numerous awards and, and one of them is the prestigious NFF, uh, NSF Career Award for her study on digital uh, privacy. And, and you know, I'm very happy to see how those, how those two teams are coming together now in this talk today on blockchain and privacy. So, Catherine, please take it away. Well, that's absolutely lovely. I must admit, I was smiling inside about the marketing professor comment. So, I don't know who those people were, but you echo my parents in that what, what always happened with them is I have two very British parents. And they always said, you know, well, the problem is that our friends, uh, you know, they ask what you're doing. And we say, oh, she's a professor at MIT. And then that sounds good. And then they ask, she's a professor of what? And then we have to say marketing. And it's very, very, very embarrassing. And so my parents have learned to call me a professor of tech, the economics of technology, which apparently goes better with uh, British posh people. But if you're sort of, you know, if you're wondering where it all fits in, I hope I'm going to explain. In that basically, you know, so I, I, I am a professor of marketing, I'm very proud to be. And uh, the reason I'm proud to be is that in some sense, marketing has been on the forefront of thinking about issues of data and privacy relative to, I think, any other field. And that's given me a huge opportunity to think about privacy, which I've also now taken to think about the application of blockchain. And that's gonna be the focus of my speech today. Now, of course, because this is a keynote, it means I have to start off with some sort of general grand thoughts. And I'm gonna do that before then going into an actual empirical stuff. Now, what are the grand thoughts gonna be? Well, the grand thoughts are gonna be this, which is that one of the things that I've been writing about in terms of privacy for a long time is that if we go back 25 years ago now, we got it completely wrong. 
in that we thought that the internet was gonna be an instrument of anonymity. And if you think about the policy discussions at the time, it was all, well, how do we cope with something where people are essentially anonymous? How are we gonna manage, man, manage that from a policy point of view? Now, of course, back in 2021, we know that's not how the internet debate was worked out. Instead, the policy issues with the, uh, with the internet have been turned out to be the opposite of anonymity. Instead, it's been the question of what you do with one of the best surveillance technologies that's ever existed, and how do you manage the data economy which has come out of it. And I'm gonna try and make the odd argument that blockchain is a similar general purpose technology is gonna see a similar evolution, even if we're not there yet. You know, if you think about how it all starts, right? Again, it's going to be a, an area which is all about anonymity. Uh, and in, in fact, it's going to be embraced by people who explicitly reject what they see happening on the internet with the growing spread of surveillance and they're re-embracing anonymity. And so that's how it started and how is it, how is it going right now? Well, you know, if you think about having it's going right now, you know, what are exciting areas of blockchain applications? It's doing again, exactly the reverse of thinking about anonymity. It's actually about thinking, well, how can we use blockchain to try and implement some of the more intrusive surveillance style of technologies such as, or policies such as know your customer. So I'm gonna argue in this talk that in some sense, the march of digital technology is as often the march from anonymity to being one of a surveillance tool. And I'm gonna try and make three points about how we think about that specifically in the realm of blockchain. Now, what are these three points gonna be? Well, the first, three po the first two points are gonna be keynote worthy, big general points. And then the third point is going to be a more specific uh, set of studies. And these set of studies are the bit you might not know about in terms of the 2014 digital currency experiment and what we learned about privacy as a result. So this is the, pay, the bit of the, pay, the paper which was definitely not published in science. All right, so let me start off with my first two general keynote worthy points, which are going to be about this general tension between privacy and blockchain. And here I'm going to point to a paper I wrote, which was very unusual for me in terms of paper, in that it was completely uh, just writing about ideas. And basically, um, I was asked a little bit of time ago to try and think, well, what do we think about blockchain and privacy? And in this paper, we made this argument that far more so than sort of general purpose digital technologies, blockchain holds many challenges for privacy. And in particular, we identified this challenge, which is that if you think about blockchain, where is a lot of its value? Its value comes from data integrity and data in persistence. But data persistence and data integrity are actually the enemy of a lot of people's privacy, uh, ability to protect their privacy. And why is that? Well, there's gonna be two key points. The first point is that one of the challenges when thinking about privacy preferences and protecting privacy is that our preferences over our data change over time. So how we might think about the kind of data we want to share about ourselves when we're 20 is gonna be very different from the kind of data we might want to share about ourselves when we are 30. And then how do you think about that reflecting uh, the, the fact that the ways in we're gonna use a blockchain application is in some sense to assume, to ensure that that data persists and that data can't be challenged. And so we're going to make this point that in some sense that blockchain, even though it's embraced by many privacy advocates, the, the underlying economic value is going to very much be a tension with one of the major principles of privacy policy, which is that in some sense people have the right to be forgotten. 
Now, the next point I want to make along the lines of global big points is this one, which is that underlying, so we've had the underlying blockchain is this inherent tension between privacy and the underlying technology. It's also the case that we can learn about how privacy is going to shape the spread of this innovation uh, from many different areas. And you see here, I've got another egregious self citation to a paper I wrote with Avi Goldfarb, where what we argued is if you think about the digital world, that so much of the digital world has been shaped in terms of its innovation by privacy policy. And we go through this in a variety of fields, including advertising, including health, including educational technology, and describe how privacy policies have ultimately shaped how these technologies have evolved. So we make this argument that really, if you think about innovation policy and you're thinking about ways of encouraging blockchain innovation, then you have to go and think about how it's going to be shaped by privacy policy. And for this, I'm going to go and return to what I started with, which was this idea of, well, how do we think about, say, a classic privacy style or lack of privacy style of regulation, such as know your customer? How is that going to shape the spread and uh, diffusion and, I guess, look and feel of how blockchain will look, look turn applications will look in the future? And for this, I'm going to make uh, this observation which is this, what's very strange at the moment if you think about the general ecosystem. And I've got here sort of a very general sort of graph about the ecosystem in terms of virtual asset service providers, is that at the moment, what is striking is across the world is how little implementation of privacy regulation we've actually seen, although your customer style of regulation has actually gone in to most of these, uh, these exchanges. And, my argument is going to be that when this starts to shift and we start to see stronger and stronger forms of regulation come in, trying to take away anonymity in the form of you know your customer, that's going to very much shape what this technology looks like and who adopts it and who you, and uh, what its use case is. And the reason I'm going to argue this is just simply if you think about blockchain and in general, what, what one might think of as its uh, great hole as a technology is that in some sense one of the big holes is its inability to verify what's happening in the outside world. And I'm setting here an article that Christian and I wrote uh, back a long time, well, quite a few years ago now, where we talked about this idea that, you know, say something you might want blockchain for, such as tracking new born babies, right? Because you don't want babies to go home to wrong parents. The problem is, even if you use it for this kind of purpose, you know, where we want the data integrity, we want the verification, we want all of this, it's still going to be very uh, amenable to human error if a nurse ends up mixing up the babies before she tries to link them with um, the digital technology. And what we're seeing in terms of regulation is it's going to very much try and shape that relationship between one's offline or physical identity and how it links up to blockchain style of technologies. And the argument's going to be that that's going to very much shape how we see them diffuse and spread in the next few years. So anyway, those are my big, big thoughts. And I'm looking at the chat room and I'm sort of say, seeing and in some sense, the big, big thoughts have gone like big, big thoughts that people have been flight, but we haven't got any questions yet. So I'm just pause in case there are questions, but if there aren't, I'll go down to the more detailed study. I'm seeing appetite for that detailed study coming along. So we're going to go and do that. And for this, I'm going to go and actually return to that MIT digital currency experiment. And for those of you who haven't heard about this, maybe you're, you're very, you know, theory, computer science based, what was it? Well, back in 2014, uh, the basically this is a startup. At MIT, there was a group of students, the MIT Bitcoin Club, who managed to convince some alumni 
uh, you know, and I'll characterize the alumni as rich libertarians, to give millions and millions of dollars to set up a Bitcoin paradise at MIT. And so the students made this announcement that they were going to give $100 in Bitcoin to everyone at MIT. And then, you know, to be honest, like, I think we didn't quite know what to think about it, because at the time, you know, if you think what we were thinking about Bitcoin in 2014, we all sort of, you know, what the use case is, I guess, you know, prostitution, drugs, illegal gambling, it didn't seem like the kind of thing that necessarily you want to be putting in the hands of 18 year olds. But on the other hand, we're MIT and we wanted to embrace new technologies and we want to encourage our students to do cool and wacky things. And so what happened at this backdrop was that Christian Catalini and I were brought in to be the face of respectability <laughs> in this experiment. And as you may know, Christian is now leading the work at Meta as the lead economist for their digital currency project. Um, and I, I'm, I'm, the, I'm the remaining sort of face, I guess, of academic responsibility uh, of this at MIT. Anyway, what we're going to do is we're going to take some data we had from that experiment. And I should be clear that this is work we're still in the process of publishing. It's so down a little bit because Christian's obviously been so busy. But for me, it's really fascinating data because it's all about how people react to thinking about their privacy in a context of here with blockchain application of digital currency. And it's going to allow us to try and tease apart some essential questions about privacy, which are also going to be important for thinking about the evolution of blockchain, which is really, well, why is it that people say they care so much about their personal data and then share them with commercial firms? Why do people say that they hate the government spying on them, but then keep on going? And, you know, why is it that we don't all take basic steps to protect our privacy? Why is it that we use, we don't use um, Signal? Why is it we don't use DuckDuckGo? What is going on in terms of that, those decisions we're making? Now, um, I'll, just, I'll just encourage all of you, for those of you who haven't done it, you should do your Bitcoin math and actually work out how much that $100 is worth right now. It's quite extraordinary. Um, but I'll just remind you what, what happened and how this is gonna to relate to the privacy. So as I say, you know, in the paper we wrote and published, we were really thinking about the adoption of Bitcoin. Here, when we're thinking about privacy, the data we're gonna be using is really around the choice of wallet. And the choice of wallet is going to be, we're going to argue a good way of thinking about privacy outcomes. Because obviously for digital currencies, you can have wallets which are more privacy protective, ones which are less, and there's going to be a whole lot of trade-offs. And what we're going to bake into the experiment is a variety of trade-offs or tests, or you might think of them as just straightforward A-B tests which are going to be shown to the students at random. And it's going to, we're going to see how those influence the choice of wallet and the other choices they're going to make surrounding their data as being part of this uh, digital currency experiment. And just to remind you, the setting here is going to be MIT. It was targeted at MIT undergraduate students and MIT undergraduate students are exactly as adorable as you imagine them to be. And they are who you think they are. And probably lots of you were MIT undergraduate students. So I need to tell you how wonderful they are. And we've got to have about 70% participation. So what I want to be clear is that I'm not going to say in any sense that this is a representative group of people. But what I will argue is that this is a group of people who are deeply knowledgeable about technologies, uh, are highly informed, highly intelligent. And so we should think about all the biases going in that direction. And that's going to be important when we think about the debate. So let me take you through now some of the randomizations that we did and what we learned about privacy during it. And so the first thing we're going to talk about is what I'm going to call the small money randomization. And this is going to be revisiting this point, which is that a lot of people, you know, say, oh, I really care about privacy. I really care about privacy. And then are willing to be tracked for a loyalty card program for very, very small benefits. And what we're going to do in this, um, as part of the experiment, 
is we are going to be asking our students for the emails of their friends. And actually, we I can't tell you that this was intentional. Uh, we This wasn't meant to be part of a paper or anything. This was just something we were trying to do functionally because we had this idea that it was all going to work and we were going to be able to study network effects and we wanted to recreate a social network. And so anyway, so think of this as an accidental condition. But what we're going to do is, because we're, we're trying to establish social network data, but we're going to ask them for the emails of their friends. Now, the reason I say it was all accidental is that actually asking people for their friends' contact details is one of the most sensitive pieces of information you can ask someone. So to give you an idea of how sensitive it is, I've got this sort of survey about what people, kind of data people care about. And you'll see there that a list of your contacts and their information is basically the second most sensitive area of data next to your social security number. So we're going to take this as being a really sensitive piece of data we're going to be asking about, and we're going to be finding out whether or not they actually gave it to us. Now, what's going to be the condition? Well, the condition is going to be quite simple. For half the students, we're going to tell them that when they give us their contact needs or their friends, they're going to get pizza. The other half, no pizza. And we just, you know, you might be interested what, what descriptions were of the pizza. We just said cheese pizza. We weren't that specific. It was cheese pizza or not. And so we're going to run this test to see what happens when we offer people cheese pizza for their contact details. Now, what we're going to be measuring as our measure of protection of privacy or people taking steps to protect their privacy is going to be we, got, we have a variety of measures, of course, in the paper, but the one I'm going to focus on this talk is whether or not you give completely fake data. Because remember, I'm not verifying whether or not people are submitting true email addresses, right? We're not, we haven't got any checks in the system. And one of the ways of avoiding surveillance here is just to give us fake data. Now, what I want you to see from this graph is that this very sort of extreme form of privacy protection is going to be very, very influenced by whether or not you have pizza. And in particular, the moment that you start offering people pizza is the moment that they start giving you the contact details of their friends. So what can we take from this? Well, so the first thing you might sort of say when looking at this chart is, well, oh, but maybe you're not really measuring anything about sort of privacy protection. Maybe it's just to do with like how careful you are at entering the data, right? Maybe it's like, if you think the friends, you think there might be pizza involved, you've got to be careful entering the data. And so as a result, perhaps that's what you're measuring, not about privacy preferences. So one thing we actually did was we went to look at the email addresses to see whether or not it looked intentional or accidental. And I can tell you, it looked very, very, very much in, in, intentional. And by that, I mean, is that when you looked at the people who were submitting all invalid email addresses, they weren't just, you know, misspelling things by accident. They were ex they were intentionally insulting us as researchers in terms of how they wrote the email addresses. So I don't know how to put it politely, but basically fuck off at mit.edu would be a typical piece of data in that blue column, right? People were very, very, very much intentionally trying to avoid surveillance. Now, as you see with pizza, right, we start to lose that protective behavior. And the one thing I always, I always emphasize, which really fascinated me about this study, is that where is the big effect coming from? Uh, so the big effect was actually coming from what we're going to call students in privacy sensitive dorms. Because at MIT, just the way it works, we have lots of different dorms. And there were dorm rooms where people tend to go if they're more, say, management majors or econ majors. And then there were dorms where you tend to go if you're more some hardcore hacker type. And they're going to have very different privacy references in these different dorms. And I'm going to use that as my division of how privacy sensitive you are. But what you're going to see here is it's actually the dorms. Uh, you know, we measured sort of their privacy preferences, people living in those dorms, which are very privacy sensitive, which are really driving this effect. 
in that what we saw is that when you don't give people any incentive, they behave in a way which is completely consistent with their preferences towards privacy. And they actually take steps to try and avoid giving you data. Half of the moment, the pizza's on the line. You'll notice that even those people who express the strongest privacy preferences just look like everyone else. Now, I'm just going to pause here and say that this is a result which I've had the pleasure of presenting in Washington. And what's strange about this, uh, this result when you present it uh, you know, up, up, in, up to government is that any side of the policy debate loves can, can use it. In that on the one side, you have Republicans saying, okay, well, this study just shows that when people say they care about their privacy, they don't mean it, right? They're gonna give it up for pizza, so we don't have to regulate to protect privacy. On the other hand, Democrats see this and say, oh my gosh, if MIT kids can't be trusted to protect their privacy, you know, given they're very knowledgeable in the light of pizza, that means we really need a lot of privacy protection to stop people behaving so stupidly. So you could take this a lot of ways, but for me, it's a really good study in terms of trying to illustrate what we call the privacy paradox and thinking why it is that people behave in a way which seems completely inconsistent with their privacy preferences. So that was the first part of the study, which I thought helped us think about privacy. There were two other parts, but I'm just gonna pause now in case there are any questions about pizza. Uh, I have a question. So even if uh, people would uh, give their email addresses that are valid email addresses, you have no way of verifying whether they are friends' email addresses or just, you know, registrar at, at, uh, at MIT, uh, johndeer.com. Uh, oh, yeah, I should explain that we, that, because we made it a little bit easier for ourselves than that, because we said they had to be MIT email addresses, and of course we got the list of email addresses. And so this was really what you put before the at mit.edu and how insulting it was. Right, which sort of made, we made our life easy. Now, Martin's got a really interesting question, which is like the private externality point, right? Because I mean, so for those of you who aren't aware of this debate, there's a huge shift in how we're thinking about privacy. As, as, we, as the digital world becomes incredibly more complex, we're realizing that thinking about privacy as an individual property right gets it all wrong. And that actually one of the key parts of our privacy choices is there's going to be externalities in terms of spillovers to our friends and families as things can be inferred about our data from that. And I'm sure that's true. I mean, all I'm going to be, I don't probably have anything on privacy externalities in this paper. But if you think about why it is that friends' email addresses are so sensitive, it's presumably coming from this privacy externality point. It's a bit of a blunt instrument, but you can see it there, I think, more so than other places, right? That we're not giving up our own data precisely, we're giving up definitely mutually shared data. So let me now go to the, the second part of the study. And the second part of the study is what we're going to call small costs. And in some sense, this is going to be a little bit more sort of, I guess, digital currency-esque, because the pizza was just the pizza. But in this, what we're going to do is we're going to have a variety of wallets. And these are going to be the wallets of the time of 2014. But the idea is going to be that this choice of wallet is going to really influence what you choose um, how much privacy protection you have. And in some sense, we're going to take a complicated issue and simplify it and say that really the choice here is going to be between have a commercially minded wallet, which focuses on, you know, complying with do you know your customer and other such of intrusive forms of intrusive surveillance versus having a wallet where there's no such surveillance, but in some sense, the lack of surveillance means there's a larger risk that if you, for example, destroy your key, then you just can't get access to your money. So that's going to be the big trade off that we're, the way we're putting towards our, our students. And they're going to have to choose a wallet to work out where they're going to put their hundred dollars in Bitcoin. Now, 
here we're going to, here I'm just sort of trying to set out exactly what that privacy risk is. And it sort of goes back to my second point, which is these wallets differ to the extent to which they tie your physical identity back to the blockchain. And that's the trade off you're making. There's an advantage for you of having it tied. And it means that if you lose your key or something, you, your computer corrupts or something like that, you've got a way of reaccessing your money. But then there's the trade off of anonymity, which, which you're taking off. Now, what we're going to do is we're going to randomize the order of, of, um, of the wallets. And we're going to then see the extent to which that affects the choice of uh, how private your wallet is. And what I want you to see here is that we saw something quite strange that we weren't expecting to see. In that we're just showing, like, we're just changing the order of these wallets on the page. It's not a huge navigation cost or search cost we're adding here from a sort of, I think, we think from a theoretical perspective. But what we're seeing is that in the data, just the ordering of the wallets can actually make a huge, you know, actually have, you know, around a 10% effect, as you can see here, on how privacy protective the choice was that the, the student made. And so I thought that was incredibly striking just because this is such a small cost of we're thinking about it, about making privacy protective choices. And we're seeing it really affect how people behave. And I want to point out, you might be like, oh, those people, they're just like people who just don't know what they're doing, so they choose the first thing. But even people who are tech savvy, who know about technology, they're still choosing the first thing, right? And so in other words, this is telling us that a taste for privacy and a consistent choice for a privacy protective wallet can be diverted or distorted by very, very small navigation costs in the process. All right, so the last uh, sort of bit of the experiment I'd like to talk about is what we're gonna call small talk. And it's gonna be another form of distraction. And for me, this is really interesting. So one of the things we did to our poor students is we gave them a choice about how to, whether or not they basically encrypted uh, their user details when they emailed us. And I want to be clear, it, was, it wasn't actually intentional again. We're going to randomize half of them into having the choice, but it just happened that the way of getting the encryption key to work turned out to be harder than we realized, right? We were sort of outside of designers, we thought it'd be easy, um, but it turned out to be actually hard. And we could tell this just because people, like these were clever MIT kids, but Around half of them failed to actually use the encryption key correctly. Anyway, so what we're going to have is we're going to have a distracting piece of technology, which is whether or not you encrypt in your message to us uh, your user details. And half of the people are going to be exposed to that option. And what we're going to find is we're going to then actually add this to the experiment where we are. Um, explaining the different wallets and the extent to which people are going to choose it and what kind of uh, what they're going to know. And what we're going to find out is that in the condition where people don't have the scratching information about encryption, they're going to start to pay attention to this information. But the moment we put in all this stuff about PGP and how to encrypt emails and how to encrypt survey responses and all of this stuff, that's actually going to distract people from the primary task of choosing a privacy protective wallet. And I'm just going to show you this. You're going to see it's a little bit, I want to be, I, I, I sort of want to be clear that this is a little bit less significant than some of the other results, but I still find it interesting which is here, um, the y-axis is going to be, do you choose a wallet which is linked to a bank account in a way which means that your data is going to be disclosed? And what I want you to see here is that the moment that we're adding in this nudge 
about encryption, this encryption randomization, we're going to see that our wallet choosers are going to start universally to make choices towards their wallet, which are less privacy protective. Now, I'm not a psychologist, I'm not a behavioral economist. People talk about mental depletion or something like that. That could be the mechanism here. But what we see clearly is that when you give people distracting information about another form of privacy protection, that it can help divert them from actually paying attention to the real privacy choice here, which was how privacy protective was your wallet. So what do we learn from all of this as we're getting, I've got eight minutes left, which is, so, you know, I presented, uh, well, first of all, I presented Big Thoughts, and now I've actually talked to you a little bit about the MIT privacy experiment and what we could learn about privacy. I want to be very clear, there's lots of limitations to what we learn here. Um, this is MIT students, like far better informed about privacy technology than most people. Um, the only thing I'd say is that this is, I think, useful from a policy debate point of view, because one of the arguments made in lots of the policy debates is that people just don't understand and know about privacy. And here we've got very knowledgeable people who understand a lot about technology and privacy continuing to show these distortions, which for me means, makes me think that a lot of the privacy debate is not just about information asymmetry. Another sort of limitation here is these are very specific links, right? Or local, sorry, I'm speaking a empirical econ here. These are very specific randomizations. I am trying, because this is a keynote speech, to interpret them very generally in terms of this idea of small costs, you know, small talk and so on. But I want to be clear, we're only going to be measuring the particular randomization we did, and uh, you, you're going to have to, live, you should really strictly limit your interpretation to that. And just this, this last point is, what does it all mean? I've shown that for a blockchain technology, potential consumers can be very easily distracted from protecting their privacy by very small benefits, by small navigation costs, by distracting information. Now, if we take a step back and say, well, what does that mean for privacy policy? We're now in, back in the debate in Washington, which is, do you then think that this means that we don't trust what people say about their privacy because it's so easily distorted away? Or do you think this is more evidence that we need to do more to help people protect their privacy given how easy it is to distort? So anyway, the summary of what you should have seen today is that we have, we have done a lot to try and summarize some of the kind of privacy paradox we see in practice. And we've got to use the, the, the example of the choice of various Bitcoin technologies to illustrate this. And we show that the small money or giving people pizza means they're going to give up very sensible, sensitive data suddenly. Uh, very small navigation costs means that people start to actually choose technologies which aren't as privacy protective, even if they have very privacy, uh, even they ex express high privacy preferences. And that even people who say that they're very worried about government surveillance, for example, uh, are willing to link their bank account to their Bitcoin account very explicitly in a way which means they can be tracked by the government when they re receive reassuring information about something completely orthogonal such as encryption. All right. So with that said, I think I should then go to my final set of points. And my final set of points is just to, of course, reiterate what I was trying to say in my grandiose uh, keynote way, which is that, you know, I was looking through the program of token economics and it struck me that, you know, privacy wasn't really much part of the debate so far. And so I'm hoping to reinsert it in there. And why do I think it's so important? Well, in some sense, I've, maybe we could sort of argue about mobile, we could argue about other types of technologies, but I would argue that for blockchain, there's just such an inherent tension between the fact that so many enthusiasts in the digital currency crypto community 
embrace ideas of anonymity when if you think about it actually blockchain is one of the ultimate surveillance technologies just because it's all about persistence and trying to understand identity i also made that second argument which is that ultimately privacy regulation much like we've seen with other technologies will ultimately shape the evolution of how these technologies work. And I use the argument that this is going to come about, especially when we have regulations which more closely make us tie what happens on the blockchain to people's physical identities. And then I basically went through a detail and gave you some empirical results about how we can start to think about the small nudges choices framing which affect how people themselves approach the, their privacy on a blockchain style of technology. So with that, I will say I love quest I would love questions. I think I've got all three minutes for questions, but I would still love them just in case anyone's got any anything they'd like to chat about. Uh, yeah, you go ahead. Hi, uh, this is Catherine. Thanks, Catherine. This is a very interesting talk. I, I just want to ask one question. Do we think people are supposed to attach a lot of value to the privacy consider in these experiments? For example, if I think about choosing the accounts, which one is more, uh, I mean wallets, which one is more private or not, maybe I'm just using it to accept these 100 bucks worth of Bitcoin. <laughs> Uh, never use it after. So whether it reveals my information or transaction, that doesn't really matter too much to me because I'm not going to use it anyways. So it would be diff very different from say a bank account where you use it constantly uh, transact. There you probably have a more higher value attached to those sort of anonymity issue. I, I just want to yeah, have your sense of that. Well, that's really interesting, right? Because I think one of the, I don't know, one of the limitations, well, I don't know if it's limitation, but one of the interesting things about interpreting the results is this was obviously for a very nascent form of the technology, right? And, you know, the idea of the MIT Bitcoin experiment was obviously that everyone was going to be using these wallets and we were going to set up a Bitcoin paradise at MIT. That never happened, of course, but that was going to be the idea. So maybe, you know, if I take your question the right way, is that the way to think about all these parameter estimates is that they're really representative of what people do at the beginning under uncertainty about how a technology is going to be used. Right? Yeah. I think it was, I think it'd be fair to, I don't know if we can even characterize it one way or the other, but maybe you could sort of say that there's so much uncertainty here and if you want to make a positive argument, it could be the degree of uncertainty made people more susceptible to these small framing differences in how they how they made their choices. Right. That's one way to phrase that. Yeah. I think we're in agreement, but I think it's an important way of sort of putting the results into the appropriate box. Yep. Thank you. Uh so, Martin, uh, I, uh, uh, you have one minute <laughs> because then Catherine needs to uh, needs to go. Uh, so, go ahead, Martin. Last question. So, very short question about your first point. So, you're kind of you're kind of describing like this this trend that uh, blockchain cryptocurrencies uh, is kind of a force almost against privacy, but then uh, and that's also kind of where we see like the regulatory forces going uh, a lot of. AML, KYC requirements now for stable coins, exchanges. Um, but then on the other end, we also see this development of privacy coins, uh, different ways to try to enhance privacy uh, in the crypto space. How do you see kind of these two uh, forces uh, evolve in the future? Is it going to diverge in two different worlds, two different universes? Or Well, you know, I... Number one, I, I'm just going to put, I, it's a very unusual paper I wrote, the first one, because it's just all like big thoughts. I was in Europe and I got to write big thoughts, right, in a way that, you know, you don't usually as, a, uh, as, a, as an academic economist. So I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to put that in the chat window. Uh, so in terms of the big thoughts, this division, as you're talking about, this is, you know, I, I'll, 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 I'll give my opinion because it's a keynote and I can give an opinion with no real, with no real basis, which is this, is that, 
Let's think about something. We have so many examples about what we're going to call privacy competition in the world. And there's so many technologies where you've got the privacy protective version and the unprivacy protective version. And every time we see similar patterns. So let me give you some examples, right? We've seen it with DuckDuckGo. We've seen it with Signal. We've seen continually people make choices which in the end, the privacy protective technology becomes the niche and the non-privacy protective technology becomes mainstream, right? So if I had to make a bold prediction in the way of a keynote, I don't see any reason why that would happen again there. Um, but I just always feel quite honestly, the sense of, I don't know how I explain it, but it's so strange working in privacy, knowing so many people who are enthusiastic about privacy working in this space and everyone ignoring the fact that this is one of the most, you know, one of the best surveillance technologies that's ever existed. Does that make sense? Thank you. Yes. Okay. So, uh, so, so, please join me in in thanking Catherine for for this very interesting and thought provoking uh, thought uh, provoking uh, talk. And uh, Catherine, it was wonderful to have you here. I know you need to run, and there are still many questions. And I think uh, you know we are going to have a discussion uh, right. long, long afterwards. Thank oh, you. Oh, that, that's wonderful. And what I'd say is. Uh, with apologies, I am teaching at one o'clock. So if anyone wants to come in a breakout room with me for the next 10 minutes, that would be complete.